Hi everyone, welcome to our Development Promotions webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a great um, amount of agents joining us today, which we're always so excited about. And thank you for the past couple of weeks for all your support, it's been amazing. So don't despair, Shelly's still here. She will come on just now. I thought I'll do the intro in case you, you wonder where our darling Shelly is, she's still with us. Um, what we thought we'd do today is I know that there has been lots of various people under a lot of stress and under a lot of doom and gloom. It has been a tough couple of weeks and it will be a tough couple of weeks. And so what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of insight into us working so closely with our very, very good friend, Natalia. She has been amazing. She certainly is pushing for us to be in this I Am Tourism. And so our development promotions team is right behind her under the hashtag I am tourism. Guys, I think it's a wonderful campaign and it brings us all on the same page. And we need to work together as much as we can to get this, this tourism industry open and we can do it. And so I'm gonna hand over to Natalia to explain to you how it works, why it works. And if we can all follow one campaign, I think it's amazing. So please have a great webinar. We'll have some wonderful destinations later and um, a wonderful recipe. And thank you again for joining us. And Natalia, thank you for everything you do for us. Um, we appreciate you hugely and you are a complete treasure to us. So I'm going to hand over to Natalia to take us forward on the hashtag I am tourism. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Hi guys, sorry, I'm not sure if you, you're able to hear me. I hope you are. I'm having extraordinary issues with my internet today, which is highly inconvenient because I've just run a one and a half hour SATA webinar around UIF2. So I'm going to keep it quick. Um, I hope that some of you will have... ...of a broad background on... Privileged group travel and tourism in to get travel reopened as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. The travel and tourism industry is not an industry that uh, behind mining in terms of the economic contribution that we make. So can you believe that? Number two, and nobody cares that we exist. So we have been lobbying for tourism and travel to reopen. We've got all these safety and hygiene protocols. We've been knocking on millions of doors to get open. And we just haven't got anywhere. Even though we have 1.5 million people who are employed by tourism and travel, 70% of which are women, 60% are youth, 49,000 SMEs. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So eventually, after banging my head against a brick wall, I have had enough that government hears my message. So I just said that it is very important to them that there is inclusive growth in the economy through women. But by denying women, those 70% of women who comprise travel and tourism, the ability to generate a livelihood for our family, you are in fact disempowering us and making us even more vulnerable to things like gender-based violence. Okay, so we launched this I Am Tourism campaign, which falls underneath the campaign that we've been running called South Africa is Travel Ready. You might have seen it, South Africa is Travel Ready. And this I Am Tourism campaign is to give a voice to the women in tourism and travel who have been affected by town. So there are a number of techniques that we are using to raise the awareness around uh, women. And I made it really, really quick and easy for you today by giving you the five things that you can do. Now you will see on your screen and you will see a little bit, you have seen a little bit earlier, the photographs that the DP team have put together. We have a target of 5,000 of these images by Women's Day. Now, for my men who are in the audience, this is not about you. This is not to marginalize you. We recognize that you are part of this. You, it's your female colleagues um, to take a photograph of themselves with I Am Tourism. And if they're worried about um, being identified, they can wear a mask. But we need to try and get as many of these photographs as quickly as possible 
to the iamtourism.za at gmail.com email address. Um, this is part, one, of, one component of our campaign, and I said the target is 3,000, but really what would make my heart sing is if I could not But all, all the surveys that we have done to date, affected is by giving them the data so the data is there just as a backup to give uh, black and white information to all of the voices and to the faces of the women that you see today and we, we are also telling stories of those women who've been affected so if you know a woman in tourism or travel that has been affected as a result of the lockdown please let us know who this person is you can email us, um, and I'm sure Roland will throw it into the chat, at info at travel to South Africa.org, info at travel to South Africa.org. Send us their name and contact detail, we'll get a hold of them. Or if you know a woman who has influence at government level, in civil society, in business, someone whose voice would be heard, please let us know who these people are because we need to try and get the voices of those women who are not heard to be heard publicly. Work with your associations. If you're a member of an association, find out what they're doing. Don't go off in your own direction. This is the time where we all need to sing off the same hymn sheet. And lastly, go to traveltosouthafrica.org. You'll see there's a little toolkit tab there. There's some information on what you can do to get behind one cause so that we are shouting from the rooftops because that is the only way that we get heard. We will not get heard going off in a million different directions. So that's me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And sorry if my internet broke up all the time while I was going through it. Charles, was it okay? Did you hear me? Yes, sorry, it was dropping a right. bit. But thanks, guys. Thanks, Natalia. It was absolutely awesome. And we all got the gist of what you're speaking about. And we appreciate you to heaven and back. You've just been amazing. Thank you, Nats. Thanks, Charles. So, Charles. Thanks, Nats. Hi everyone. Um, yes, I'm back as Jack said, just in case any of you got all like emotional. I don't know if you've heard. Um, but today what we've really got is um, we've got a, a stunning speaker as well after Natalia and it's Candice. Um, Candice is joining us today. She's from Travel Start and she's going to chat about um, her G-Adventures trips. So just before we start, I just want to remind you about our wonderful Sarah and Joe that look after G-Adventures in South Africa. And I'm going to welcome Candice. And hopefully Candice is with us. How's it going, Candice? <laughs> How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you all? Good. So welcome, Candice. Thank you so much for your time. It's so incredible to have you with us. You're one of our best G ambassadors from a point of view that you really do your G trips. You travel with G and that's who you choose. So, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and do a nice little overview of who you are and what you've done? Okay, so I'm born in Cape Townian. I'm actually a qualified occupational therapist. So I did that for six years, worked in the States and the UK. And then I joined travel in 1999. I always said it's like Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. Um, <laughs> I worked in a flight center for 12 years. I um, started um, as a travel consultant and managed a store, the product development manager, and then I went into contracting. And I've been at Travel Start for eight years in July. So I do all the air contracting and supply relations and deals, etc. Fantastic. So Candice, what we thought today, because you've done four amazing G trips and they're very different destinations, is I suppose my first question is why did you choose G Adventures? If we look at you know, sort of an overview of the product. So I'm, I'm a little bit sorry, guys. I'm just, I, I'm like epic destinations that are a little bit different. So um, I wanted, I chose G Adventures because I wanted to go to places that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable traveling um, independently on my own. So I would be comfortable going to Europe or Mauritius on my own, etc. Yes. I really like um, shells to kind of go to the places that are a little bit um, untouristy. And places like Iran and Colombia, etc. The kind of places that people say to you, why the hell are you going there? You know, like, are you mad? You know, Absolutely. I had a lot of that when I went to Iran, a lot of questions like, why am I going? So I chose G 
I think just to have access to go and visit um, these these off the, the track um, countries and also um, you know being in a small group you know that most of the tours are around 12 to 15 people so I mean you come in as strangers and you leave as friends I mean on one of my trip two of the people um, got together got married they've had four kids oh really so, oh that's wonderful yeah. so people you're constantly in friends with you know also lots of mixed nationalities I like G there's not one particular nationality they kind of tend to be North Americans Europeans and quite a few Aussies and Kiwis um, also like the, the flexibility, it usually includes the main sites, but it's also a lot of um, free time. So you have a lot of free time to be able to do whatever you want in the evenings. If you don't want to go with the group to dinner, you can do that. So, so let me just say I am not a kind of package tourist jumping on a coach tour kind of traveler. And that is certainly not what G is. So it's basically like traveling with a group of friends. So What's nice is that you can do it with someone. So two of the tours I've done just with my daughter, I'm uh, sorry, with my friend Kim from Blightsight and my daughter. And one of the trips I've just done with my daughter and then Iran I did on my own. I wasn't sure if I wanted to take my daughter to that. So, yes. um, and then it's also quite, it's competitively priced. Um, I like the fact that you can pay a deposit and only you know, pay the balance before you go. So it just helps with planning. And I just really like the fact that they care about um, the planet. And just hear yes. about the local communities where, where the tours are. And they give they give a lot back to the local communities where the tours are. Absolutely. So right. And I mean, just to, to jump into something else, I mean, you mentioned Iran. I know we're not doing it, unfortunately, next year. But what made you choose Iran, just briefly, before we go on to the rest, Candice? Because it fascinates me. <laughs> <laughs> As people, um, as people do, I think. Oh. Yeah, I have a list on my fridge. It's a tatty old list on my fridge that I that I kind of I, I think I you know when I when I read and I explore read blogs and stuff you know there's certain countries that, that fascinate me and Iran has always been one of them and it certainly didn't um, it didn't disappoint. It, it oh, was brilliant! One of my most favorite places I've ever ever traveled to. Never felt um, unsafe one bit. Um, but it's, I'll chat a little bit about it later. Absolutely. Yeah. So Candice, if we um, sort of go on from here, I thought what we'll do is we'll sort of break down the different aspects and maybe let's talk about the transport. So they'll be talking about it across the board because you did four tours. Do you want to just highlight the transport? Because we always say it's local transport. I mean, what does that mean in your mind and how did you see that? Yeah. So it's not local in the fact that you're with the chickens and, and, and that kind of thing, but you don't, you don't really feel like a tourist, although there are obviously 15 of you and sometimes you obviously stand out a little bit. So the, the, the transport that they use is, is comfortable, it's, it's authentic. So I mean, for example, most of the tours run with a kind of private minivan or maybe a small little bus, you know, not the kind of big kind of coaches shells. Um, there's a lot of local trains and buses, you know, obviously a destination like Japan, um, you are on the most amazing um, rail system in the world. I mean, if that train says it's coming at 12.12, it pulls into the station at 12.12. And if it's one minute late, they will apologize profusely. Oh, really? And yeah, and um, so, you know, different, depending on the, dis the dif um, destinations that I've traveled to, the, the transport is slightly different. You know, you can have bullet trains in Japan, so you can have these renovated Jeep Willys in Colombia, these basically these really cool um, Jeeps. So this is us on a train in Iran. So we're having a picnic. Wow. Yeah, um, is it your own all... picnic, yes. Did you bring the picnic? <laughs> <laughs> a train picnic. Um, yes. And the next picture is a picture of uh, the Jeep Willys in Colombia. So they're these really cool, um, there's Kim Kroll on the right, for those of you that don't know her, um, or that know her. And this is the Jeep Willy, so they renovate them and they can take you up into the mountains and stuff. So, and then, you know, you could have, um, for example, in, in, sorry, just go back two slides. I don't have the, thanks. Then you've got the vintage cars in Havana, um, which are amazing. You'll never get tired. There's a picture here of it. Um, so and are they legit? I mean, when you see them, Candice, they legit cars and they look vintage and they are vintage. <laughs> they are, and they're amazing. You can get a you can get an airport shuttle from the airport in Havana and they'll pick you up in one of these cars. So you really oh, feel fantastic. You're back in the 19 whatever, you know, traveling. Yes. So the, the, the transport is really awesome. So, but mostly I would say it's in, in a very small buses, no big kind of coach touring and, and kind of local buses and trains where you're doing and, and obviously lots of walking. 
Fantastic, fantastic. And then if we go on to the accommodations, I think you had done the classic, if I remember, on was that on all your tours? Yeah. Um, so just sort of chat about, and I think it's always good to know from a Jared Ventures point of view how comfortable that is, you know, that you do feel comfortable and that doesn't exceed your expectations as well, given that you went to very different countries. So the accommodation is always very central. So it's never like far out of the city. So you find that it's always a very short walk. So for example, in Japan, if you pull into the railway station to wherever you're going, it's usually a five minute walk from the railway station to the hotel. Oh, so they do central shells, like just um, in terms of the sites and also to, to public transport. So which is nice if you doing your own thing in the evening and you want to jump on the tube or the train or take a bus, you know, it's quite easy to kind of get yourself a ride. They're very clean and um, comfortable and um, they all have ensuite bathrooms. And then what's also really nice is there's a lot of authenticity in, in the accommodation. So you can have a rear can in Japan, which uh, I think I've got some photos of it. Yes, you have a caravan survive. So this, for example, is some of the accommodation in Iran. Sorry, Roland, just go back one. Just, um... So that's so incredible. Hotel in <laughs> and then on the right is a caravan So these in the in the very olden days is where the, the silk route used to go. So we're basically okay. the um the sellers, you know, with the camels, I've lost the word, used to travel <laughs> through Persia and they would stop here for the night. So it's a very authentic, amazing, very different kind of accommodation. And in the next one you'll see the hacienda. It always sounds so exotic, Hacienda. I know, it's so pretty, huh? very <laughs> pretty and colourful. <laughs> so this is a, um, it's basically a, a family run kind of Hacienda in, in Colombia. So this would have been our room on the left hand side. You can see it's very big and comfortable and clean. And it was this amazing place with all this funky decor and it had a jacuzzi and a pool <laughs> and a volleyball. Um, and we spent like two days there in, in Armenia and Colombia. And the next one you'll see my daughter Zen and Kim and Robin. And this was the homestays in Cuba. So Cuba has a lot of homestays. So you'll see decor is not quite what maybe um, we would have in our homes. It's very over the top and lots of fake flowers and things that you'll probably see in your grandma's house, but it's obviously very authentic. And what I like about it, Charles, is that it also just it supports the local economies because you're yeah. basically staying in people's houses. So um, the group is obviously a bit split up, but you know, oh, okay. all, for dinner. So. Yes, and then do you eat, so they cook dinner for you and you literally eat in their homes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Lovely. And this is the rear can. So those of you that have been to Japan, you'll see, um, so I know it feels, it looks like it's sleeping on the floor, which I guess it essentially is. So it's, it comes with a lot of tradition. You know, you arrive and there's green tea and you sit down at that little table. That's how the room looks when you come in. And then when it's you go down to dinner and you come back up, you'll see the beds are set up. Um, they're basically like a flat mattress on the floor with these beautiful kind of paper doors that close. So it's also very, um, very authentic. So you're not staying in kind of, you're never staying in the Hilton or any of these kind yes, of massive. the chain hotel. Yeah, which is important. And just from your daughter's point of view, I mean, how did she find it as a G traveler? You know, did she feel like she was just at, in heaven going, I mean, she went to Japan, which I think in itself is, you know, out of this world. I can call her if you guys want to meet her. <laughs> she can come and say hi. He gets very upset if I even start thinking about even going with another tour. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, she's a very passionate G adventure um, um, person and she and she loves traveling with G. She's very oh, independent. It brings out such a nice side of her because, you know, you, I don't see her on the tour. You know, she's always making new friends, sitting with new people on the bus. You know, oh, I'm not really so sure that I've got my eye on her, but um, yes. she loves she just loves it. That's lovely to know, you know, from a child point of view that actually they get on with it and, you know, they are fit in and that type of stuff. So <laughs> brilliant, Candice. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one. So, I mean, another thing that we really push from a sales point of view is our GCOs. And what we mean by that is like a trip leader, but we call them CEOs because at the end of the day, they make or break a tour. And I'm sure with G, they always make the tour. Was there anything sort of um, outstanding or exceptional that you felt you remember about one of your trips, perhaps, or any of your trips that the CEO really just was, you know, my oh, amazing. And, and you're so right, Charles. They, they make the they make the tour. They really do. If you have a great guide, which we we did consistently, um, uh, Freddie in Colombia, amazing guy. I mean, they bend over backwards to, you know, he was always like 
putting little like extra treats in for us, you know, like the last night he organized like a, in Cartagena in Colombia, he organized like a horse drawn carriage to take us to the last dinner. Uh-huh. Um, you know, things that are not on the itinerary that he kind of, and you know, like group photos, you know, with all of us, um, you know, taken with those ladies with the fruit on their head, you know, and, yeah. and just all the little extra things. And in Japan, Mika was, you know, she would spend days like putting together like little extra excursions. Like my daughter wanted to go and get dressed up like a maca. So she had organized, you know, all those little things that they put together that are, are quite a, sometimes quite a struggle when you're traveling independently. Yes. So I would say the fact that they, they're all local. So yeah. Freddie is Colombian and, um, you know, Mika was Japanese, you know, so they know the culture, they know the language, they care, they bend over backwards, they, they eat, breathe, the G philosophy. So I mean, you know, everything about about G, they um, they aspire they to. Through. Yeah, exactly. And it really, really, absolutely can make or break your tour. And lucky they were awesome on all of the trips. Oh, that's they, fantastic. Made and that's them. good to know, you know, because that is say that is one of the most. <laughs> bueno, bonito, barato. <laughs> so this is for you. It's cheap, hey. <laughs> So every time he asks us what we want to eat, we always say bueno, bonito, barato, which means pretty and cheap. That's what we want to eat. We don't want to go eat anywhere that's expensive. So, which I think we all feel like now, hey, good, pretty and cheap. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the food because obviously food, you know, from a travel point of view and going to destinations, especially like the ones you travel to, the food would play a huge part in it, I would imagine. Yeah. Do you want to touch base on that for me? So the food is, is very, you know, most of the times you're eating breakfast at the B&B or the right rear kind or wherever you're staying. So lunches are normally um, at your own um, expense and kind of not part of the tour and then we normally have dinner together but every tour is different some of the groups like to stay together like in Iran most of us had most of our meals together we weren't all brave enough to kind of go off and do our own thing so the food is is very authentic so I mean for example in Colombia we went on a street you know our guy just kind of threw together like a street tour so he, he we were in his hometown so he took us to all these street vendors where we had all these amazing foods that we could try and took us to a local fruit and veg shop, you know, on the side of the road, all the vendors, they liquidized up for like a, a nice, some healthy drink for us, for example. Um, you know, sometimes you're in restaurants, sometimes you're on trains having picnics, you know, Japan, the 7-Elevens are amazing. They, and then that, it's also really nice when, um, I mean, seeing... I see all the Kit Kats, that's enough to <laughs> get us all excited. I was like, this pink. I've never seen a country with so many different Kit Kats um, <laughs> in, in Japan. And I mean, you, you can go for so much more than just the sushi. You know, everyone loves yep. sushi, but J- Japan has got so many amazing food. You can literally just go there for two weeks and eat. It is just That's incredible. Amazing. So this in the middle is the, these these little um, tables that you sit and you actually cook your own beef on, on this oh, little okay. um, heater, kind of little oven. And then on the right is kind of like the equivalent of pancakes. They, like a almost like a rusty that, that that they cook with an egg and, oh, wow. and stuff so i mean the food is very varied you know it depends on how adventurous you are um i love eating off the side of the road i mean not off the side of the road but like sweet <laughs> and stuff. Yes, um, exactly. and, <laughs> yeah. and you have a lot of freedom you know iran like you'll see the ice cream on the right amazing you put that there for me hey huh? you did put that there for exactly. me exactly <laughs> just for you charles and lots of amazing little biscuits and Turkish delights, etc. I mean, the food in Iran is amazing. It's huge. The portions are huge. You always get this, this bread and lots and lots of rice. Um, and, and, and just as I said, the, the portions are huge. So, I mean, everywhere you go, um, there's just such amazing. And you go and eat in local restaurants, which is also, mm. you know, supporting the local economy. You're not going to eat at McDonald's. And most yes, of the exactly. McDonald's, you really so. immerse yourself into the destination and get to experience it. It looks beautiful. Yeah. So and then Cuba, I mean all very you know, I see a lot of rice and things like that, but it's so authentic. I think that's just the most exciting thing is how exactly. Now this is Cuba. We we are eight lobster three days in a row. So oh, really? Sure. Um that on the left hand side is the, the lobster and rice and then they have lots of beef, um lots of lots of beans and rice and then on the right the most amazing coconut ice cream for you Sherry. Oh, wow. <laughs> really, really I know cool. where I'm going next. I said, 
<laughs> the food in Cuba is probably the you know they don't have a lot of like snacks and things you know just with all the trade embargoes you won't find a lot of like western snacks so you might just be stuck either bringing your own snacks or just um, oh, okay. you know, living on whatever there is there. So we got yes. Pringles the one day. We were so excited. Oh, did you? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that coconut ice cream will do it anyway. Hey? So yeah. Candice, I thought to sort of finish off just to highlight each of your destinations, which is really nice because then you can look at the destination in more focus and just say to us or, or highlight for us what you really found oh. interesting. If you don't so this is my daughter Zen. Um, so she, this, she went dressed as a as a micro, um, which was such an it was a two wow. hour yeah. Nice. They do your hair and your makeup and your clothes. I didn't even recognize her when she came out, and then they do like a little photo shoot, so you can um, and you can go walk outside and stuff if you want. So definitely one of the highlights of Japan is the food. You need to go hungry. It is the most delicious and varied food in the world. Like I said, it's not just um, sushi. There's amazing mm. dumplings and just incredible beef and just so much variety. Like it, there's an amazing, amazing food culture. The most in cleanest, incredible toilets. I know you think, Candice, why are you even talking about the toilets? I mean, it's, it's, it shouldn't be. Yeah, I think Japan much. is like the place. Because I've heard stories about it. It's remarkable. <laughs> The seats are warm, they play little songs, everywhere you go, the public toilets are just amazing. Ridiculous. <laughs> the efficiency in Japan is incredible, everything runs on time, people queue to cross the roads, it is just like no other country I've ever travelled to. So as I, I chatted about the rail system, I was lucky enough to go over the cherry blossom period, so mm -hmm. it was very crowded and very busy, but so worth it. It is such an incredibly beautiful time to be in Japan. Um, it's very first world Japan, but very different. I mean, you don't feel like you're in a first world, I mean, in a kind of, you know, um, Western um, culture. Yes. The temples, the gardens, the culture. Just, just be careful about the temperatures because they can be very unpredictable. We were there in April and when we went to see the snow monkeys, it was, um, it was snowing and, and we were so ill prepared for, for the snow. Um, yeah. so, and then it's not as expensive as everyone says it is, you know. And that's interested. interesting, yeah. yeah. Being like super expensive, like I yeah. said, you can go to the 7-Elevens and get the most incredible little snacks, um, little iced coffees. They've got the best vending machines in the world um, with lots of different cool drinks and iced coffees, etc. So you're very well prepared when you're doing your long train journeys and you can just buy, buy food for, for the train. And then just um, my advice is travel with a backpack because it's very hard is on the trip there's a lot of up and down stairs on and off trains because a lot of the the g tour is is on trains obviously um so my advice would be to take a backpack if you feel comfortable because it's quite difficult carrying a wheelie suitcase suitcase um, and i would imagine it's quite busy as well you know in those sort of yeah. stations and things so and then we go on to Cuba, which is so pretty. Look at that. So this is us being very cool in our Barbie car. We went, you can hire these cars for $20 and go for like an hour drive. Oh. I mean, you don't drive them, someone drives them, but you go yes. around the whole of Havana and it's very cool. So, I mean, it's just a magnificent, very time warm um, of kind of country. The, the vintage cars, like I said, I probably got a thousand photos. So you're lucky you only seen two of them. Um, we just <laughs> have enough of them. And I would, I would suggest you spend at least three to four days in Havana. Um, so we actually airbnb the first night pre-tour and then we joined uh, the tour okay. um, and, had a few, and then we had a few nights at the end. So it, there's a lot to see. It's just a really cool city to kind of get your teeth into, into Cuba. Um, like I said, lob, who doesn't want lobster for lunch? And of course. Lunch? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, the tour takes you through, it actually is really good because it takes you all the way to the eastern part of Cuba. And then we had spent a few days extra and went to Benales, which is the tobacco growing area. But the little towns are beautiful with um, amazing architecture, cobblestone streets, um, art galleries, um, amazing music, vibey cocktail. I mean, vibey you can do salsa dancing lessons, uh, cocktails. And like I said, there's a lot of homestays in Cuba, which also is really nice. You get to kind of, um, most, most of the hosts don't speak English. So it would be a nice oh, okay. brush up on your Spanish. So the Wi-Fi is very erratic. You have to basically <laughs> buy it from like a post office and you've got a queue to get the, so it feels a little bit like lockdown at the moment, Shel. So yes, you yes. Everything. So you have to queue to get the Wi-Fi and then the Wi-Fi only works within the proximity of where you bought it. So 
it's not a destination for those of you that like to be connected. Um, so those of you that, that like to be constantly on, on the internet, you, you probably won't like Cuba very much. Yeah, I won't be happy. Yeah. And just tell me, did you roll a cigar? I have to ask, because I mean, that is... I did, and we <laughs> smoked one as well. <laughs> did you? I was going to get there, but I wouldn't go straight into the smoking, because that is a fun thing. I mean, you do go, I believe you go and roll it and you do the whole thing, so that's great. And that's in Banales, which is the kind of tobacco growing area in the, it's west of, about two hours west of Havana. Oh, fantastic. So, but a very, very cool destination. Not easy to get to at the moment, but guys, yeah. So we flew through London and then on Virgin Atlantic into Havana, but oh, hopefully okay. um, TARG will be flying um, once or twice a week. So at the moment, they've always actually flown from Luanda to Havana, but it hasn't been available through the GDS, but it, it should be starting. Oh, so to that could be easier, there. definitely. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Thanks, so, Ken. Yeah, that'll well, be really cool. It'll actually be quite, quite easy to get there through, through Luanda. Yes, from very much so. And then, of course, Iran. I mean, I just love this photograph of you. So <laughs> and tell us about Iran. I love Iran. So don't listen to anyone who tells you not to go. Go, guys. It is incredible. And I'm, I'm so happy to be the, the tourist board for Iran. So if anyone has any questions <laughs> or want to think about going there, I'm very happy to chat to you about it. The people are probably the warmest, friendliest, and most curious people I've ever met in my life. Oh, really? People just want to talk to you. The English is amazing. They just want to ask you where you're from, um, you know, and, and just ask you how, what you think of Iran, um, etc. And they always want to um, engage with you. It's very authentic. It's it's untouched by mass tourism. There's hardly any tourists there, so that that made it very appealing. The culture and the architect, the most exquisite mosques, um, Persophilus is incredible. The ancient civilizations. Um, the markets feel like you step back a thousand years, you know, you wow. go through the jewelry that they're selling, you know, be a guy like sitting there with like a blanket full of these incredible um, necklaces and, and earrings, you feel like you've stepped back like a thousand years. Um, the food is surprisingly good, as I said, huge portions. It's obviously a country with no alcohol, yes. so those of you like Shirley, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you have a glass of wine with dinner. There's non-alcoholic beer, and but you're not and you're not legally going to find any alcohol. Yes, anyway, such. Okay. Be aware of that, and just have lots of patience with the visa process. The visa process is is quite complicated, um, but once you have your visa, it's absolutely worth it. And and I said the the, the, the only challenge I had was keeping my hijab on. So you do, you can see I'm wearing it quite far back. You don't have to wear uh, okay, you don't have to cover wear, like literally a pair of leggings and just a shirt that covers your elbows. You don't have to, it's not super conservative. I mean there's a lot of Iranian ladies that wear jeans, but really? your, your okay. has to be covered. That's an absolute the yes. only time you can take it off is when um, you're in your actual hotel room. Even in the lobbies, you have to you have to cover it up. It was so embarrassing the one time I was in the lobby. I don't know what I was doing. I was sitting with the group and we got up to go. And I don't know what had happened. My skirt had come loose or whatever. As I stood up, my entire skirt dropped to the ground. And I was oh, my word. in the lobby in my underwear in Iran. It was But you still had your hair covered, so that was fine. Yes. <laughs> your hair was covered. <laughs> But um, like just bring lots of clips to keep the, the, the hijab on your head because it's, it's quite, um, but it's not, it's, as, you said, as you can see there, you, your hair can show. It's, it's an amazing, amazing destination. I know you've really sold that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then, then next we go on to Colombia. Yeah. Also another very different destination. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely worth the long travel time to get there. So we threw, we flew on Turkish Airlines, which was great. Um, there's quite a long layover in both directions, but they give you STBC. So we got to see Istanbul on the way there and then flew directly from Istanbul into Bogota. Um, it's an, we were there in over December last year, so it was my last international travel um, before lockdown. And it's got an amazing diversity of landscapes and, and climates. So Bogota is at like two and a half thousand meters. It's freezing cold. And then you'll be in Cartagena, which is like 35 and humid as hell, you know. You've got the coffee region, the vibey cities, the Caribbean beaches, and then Cartagena is just a beautiful, incredible um, town, city to visit. The people are very friendly, very hardworking. There's some very interesting museums in Bogota. So you really the tour doesn't give you a lot of time in Bogota, so it's worth going an extra the day before just to kind of explore a little bit. There's a great mix of accommodation on the tour. Um, there are lots of um, just kind of 
family-run hotels. There were the haciendas that I showed you. And then we stayed in a really nice villa up north, um, just outside Cartagena, with like a swimming pool and sweeping views of the beach and parrots in the trees. It was really cool. Oh, beautiful. Um, and the tour we went on was actually two co uh, tours combined. So there was actually two oh, okay. CEOs. It was Freddie, and then we had a, um, a, another tour guide that joined us in Cartagena to take the second part of the tour. And then there was just so many fun activities, like things that were not part of the, the actual the trip that our CEO Freddie had organized for us. So they have this game called Tejo, um, which is basically you, you go to these different lanes and you throw um, you throw these kind of weights at, at small targets and they've got gunpowder in them. So when you hit it, it makes this incredible blah noise, you know. Oh, really? all while drinking copious amounts of beer. I mean, who wouldn't enjoy this as an activity? We went on a tour of the Comuna um, 13, which was traditionally one of the most dangerous areas. It's almost like a favela in um, Rio, but it was so incredibly interesting going into people's homes and just kind of walking around these hilltop um, towns that have now, they've actually, government's put in all these escalators, you know, obviously so oh, okay. the elderly can kind of get to the yeah. shops and people can move around a lot better. We went to a mud volcano outside Cartagena. Oh. Literally, you climb up and you climb into this thick mud. You can't even stand up properly. You're kind of bobbing yes. around. And salsa lessons, street food tours, hiking, etc. So definitely worth um, the long travel time to get there. It was a. It was and a did you find it, did you find it quite safe in Bogota? You know, you always watch these movies, and you know, <laughs> you don't want to say no, it, but you know, safe. <laughs> there was safe I didn't and really any <laughs> cocaine offered to me. And, yeah, that's uh, I was going to ask for the full time with And we were kidnapped. Um, that was all in the 80s. And, and uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. And, and then, then I think I've just, there's one more slide, just kind of the two group photos, just yes, um, with your friends. Yeah. As I said, you know, I'm still exactly. in contact with a lot of, on the left is, is the group in Iran and the group on in Colombia. And I'm still friends with. A lot of the people that I've met on the tours, so um, no, it's that's nice one. to have friends in new cities all over the world. So, guys, if you're ever thinking about doing a G tour, I highly recommend it. As I said, I've done four, and Joe, I'm waiting for you to put Pakistan on your itinerary, and I will be going there. And uh, I'm always on your website having a look and dreaming. <laughs> But it's wonderful. Thanks, Candice. And I think for me, what was so interesting is also just the ways you traveled, you know, with a friend or family, you know, like a family member and that. And then there are destinations. And I suppose it just goes to show that you really can, on G, go anywhere in the world and, you know, feel safe and have friends and, and just be looked after, which is absolutely brilliant. So you've certainly inspired me. I've seen a lot of comments come up where you've inspired a lot of people. They all have bucket lists and they yeah, certainly yeah. have them up. So thank you so much for your time. And then stay on with me because, you know, Candice, of course, I've got to cook a meal, as you know. So, guys, what mm -hmm. I'm doing today is instead of cooking a meal, I thought I'll make some lovely sake because that's what Japan, I think, would be the easiest. So, what I did was, as long as you've got some wine and you've got some rice, of course, there's your sake, which is rice wine. So, thanks, guys. We'll send you a real <laughs> recipe one fine day. <laughs> But thank you everyone for joining us. It's been absolutely wonderful. We've had a great time and thank you Candice. It's, it's really been a pleasure having you with us and we'll see you all again.